When working in a shop, performing any type of maintenance or assembly activity, it is important to observe the personal protective equipment criteria specified by your facility. When installing bearings, it is always important that when you remove the bearing from its packaging material to clean the bearing thoroughly inside and out to remove any slushing compound or lubricant on the bearing. When using an induction heater or any type of other bearing heater, it is important to observe the temperature specifications. This particular bearing is a sealed for life bearing. We don't want to heat this bearing up beyond 180 degrees Fahrenheit. I apply a small film on the inner race of the bearing with the bearing crayon, which will melt when the bearing reaches the proper temperature. The induction heater is energized. When the bearing reaches the proper temperature and the bearing crayon melts, the bearing must be installed immediately onto the shaft to prevent it from binding on the, on the way down. The bearing is fully seated, after which the lock washer and lock nut will now be installed and securely fastened to the shaft to prevent movement of the bearing during its cool down. The lock nut is tightened against the lock washer. Oftentimes it is necessary to use a spanner to secure the lock nut. When one of the tabs on a lock washer is aligned with an opening on the lock nut, a drift and a hammer can be used to knock the tab into the opening, securing the lock nut. The sleeve is then installed on top of the upper rotor bearing. This sleeve will provide proper spacing between the upper and lower rotor bearings. It will also seat the inner race of the lower rotor bearing. The lower rotor bearing is clean inside and out as is done with the first bearing. Once again, we use our bearing induction heater to heat the lower rotor bearing to the proper temperature of 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Once the bearing has reached temperature, it is removed and promptly installed onto the shaft. It will be seated against the spacer. Once the bearing is installed, the lock washer is then installed, followed by the lock nut. The lock nut is tightened down against the lock washer to securely fasten the bearing against the inner sleeve. Oftentimes it is necessary to use a spanner to tighten the bearing. When the bearing lock nut has been tightened, the object is to prevent movement of the spacer in a vertical motion. Once the alignment has been made, we can use a drift to knock the tab up into the opening on the lock nut, therefore securing the lower rotor bearing. Once the bearings and the inner sleeve have been installed on the shaft, the shaft will now be lifted and installed into the bearing housing. It is important to make sure that the bearing housing is clean and free of debris before you lower the shaft into the bearing housing. It's also important to keep the shaft straight so that the bearings do not get cocked once they enter the housing. If the shaft is straight, the bearings should slide in without too much resistance, after which time the upper rotor bearing seats against the shoulder, you clean the bearing and make sure that it, the shaft is firmly secured. It's important to keep any debris or particles from getting inside the housing on top of the bearings, even when you're using sealed for life bearings. The upper rotor end cover would be the next part to be installed. It has four holes that are countersunk on one side. It can only be installed in one manner. There's a shoulder on the inside which seats against the outer race of the upper rotor bearing. The specified hardware is then installed to secure the end cover to the bearing housing. It is important to note the torque specifications for the hardware you are using. The use of a torque wrench 
is always favored in this example. For the purposes of installing the lower flinger, the bearing housing must now be inverted. The bottom flinger is set in such a manner that there is 30 thousandths clearance between it and the bottom of the bearing housing. The lower flinger must also be installed on the shaft smoothly. If it gets cocked, it's very difficult to install it fully or to remove. So it's important to make sure that it goes on straight. Once the flinger is installed on the shaft and moved all the way up against the housing, we use a feeler gauge to measure the proper clearance. In this case, 30 thousandths is the spacing that we are looking for. So using the feeler gauge, I navigated around the uh, outside diameter of the flinger to make sure that it's evenly spaced. After which time, there are two set screws located 90 degrees apart on the inner hub of the flinger, which will be then secured to prevent the flinger from moving during rotation. After installation of the lower flinger, the bearing housing is then inverted again to its normal position. At this point, the housing is complete. It will now be staged for assembly of the mill. For any questions or concerns regarding the maintenance or assembly of these parts, please contact the number on your screen. Thank you.